Are we almost there? T uh, okay, it should be starting. Modulation phase. Wait, what the hell? It was a countdown to a countdown? It's bullshit. Ah. The price of freedom is steep. It's a remaster. Let me see a wagon Zach's being team. built. Making progress, Zach. And Geo. I can cut loose. This right? is a big deal. It is a big deal. It's showtime. Oh god, thank god you got rid of the, the stupid Oh no you didn't! You didn't! No more experience points. Soldier first class Genesis. A month ago. He went missing during a mission in Wutai. You know, I've never actually seen you use that. I'm really no, glad they're doing this waste? for the He's newer fans. About wear, tear, and rust. And that's a real waste. No, no, wait, this could be a mobile game. It could be a mobile game. No, I saw some uh, UI for the controller. Yeah, it's the same shithead enemies from Wutai. The same attack. Project G gave birth to the man we know as Genesis. Project G. Project oh, yeah, they did an overhaul Genesis. and Jill's and... Uh, Settle down. Zack the puppy. Gacked and Zack's face. What do you know? Shinra left dog. So same gameplay, just upgrade. So basically, they gave they gave you, they did with Crisis Core what a lot of fans wanted them to do with Seven Remake. <laughs> Hello. An angel. Heaven. Heaven. Not quite. It's a church. By the way. What Damn, they were dream? super faithful even to air its to clothes and the little first? flowers on her tank top. No. To become a hero. Oh, good. Is that more relevant? More like car. super cannon. Um, Embrace your dreams. And whatever happens, protect your honor. As soldier! Come and get it! Well, there you go. Reunion. For those of you who had no idea who the hell Zack was. This winter. Okay, very cool. What we've done, that's set in stone. The past is forever. But the future, even if it has been written, can be changed. And Jill? So focus on the future, not the past. Wait, and Jill in... Seven Remember Part 2? Oh, what the started. fuck? He wants fuck? to reclaim his birthright. Oh my! And rule over the planet with Genova. Wait, is this open world though? What is Sephiroth's endgame? I saw you lying there. I figured it was too late. So Sephiroth Wait, actually joined what you. Are you implying? That I died? This that is I'm part of the calm flashback, imposter? right? What is fact and what is fiction? You were here with me. That's years that ago. is Angeal's feather. Where are you? What happened to you? I'm trying so hard to find you. Sorry. Feel like I failed you. Okay, that actually went on longer than I thought. Rebirth. It's not called part two. Next winter, it looks one for one. Ever Crisis here looks one for one, like even the dialogue. I never fully bought how guns work in Final Fantasy VII. It, it seems like they're supposed to be lethal, like they are in real life, and yet these guys are just standing around, like while all the bullets are shooting just conveniently around them. Uh, just sorry, little quip. I think it more or less plays the same way too. Yeah, yeah, like you got the roulette wheel with the numbers and also the the the, the profile pictures, and then there's like spider points, and you, you gain more of them by killing enemies. See, we often treat Sephiroth as this kind of timeless god-like deity, that he was always the way that he was. Well, that's not true. There was a younger version of him at some point. Now, yes, there are guns in other Final Fantasy games, but it just seems like there are so many machine guns in Final Fantasy VII and lots of bullets that at some point you start to wonder, wait, how? just how lethal are bullets in 
this universe. <laughs> a month ago, he went missing during a mission. Yeah, I did an overhaul on Angel's face. He doesn't look all kind of weird and like high cheekboned. So I'm happy that they're remastering the game, like just remastering like all the CG cutscenes and the face models and such, and that the gameplay is kept more or less intact from what we can see. The pacing of that game story was very slow considering how, uh, how fast paced or more fast paced the combat was. So that's one potential consideration. That's a pipe under Midgar? What we've done, that's set in stone. The past is forever. What we've done is set in stone. The past is forever, but the future is not forever. The path that they carved for themselves after defying fate, <laughs> fighting Sephiroth in, uh, at the end of part one, they have committed to a series of events in the timeline. <laughs> so is this a way of explaining how the parallel timeline thing works? But the future. And Geo's feather, but the future, even if it has been written, can be changed. I think they're going with the timeline thing. So focus on the future. So focus on the future, not the past. That's what it's saying. It's saying that there's going to be some point in 7 Remake Part 2 or 3 that they're going to be forced to make a decision on which future we follow. We can't change the past, but we can change, quote-unquote, the future. That's the, that's the same meteor hitting Midgar. Or hitting the Earth. A vision of one possible future that they can potentially change? Okay, so this is looking quite horizon-y. <laughs> We're finally outside. Of uh, Midgard, that's like a bunch of trees and shit too. What the hell is this? Oh, I don't. This could be part of a structure or something. But some lampposts right here, and I'm hoping that you can climb up. Like, see, this is the this is the 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 path, right? But I'm hoping that what this means that there's like a whole crap ton of like environmental detail. You can climb over these rocks and stuff. There's you I here. Um, your destination is about a thousand seventy meters away. There's a command button right here, but no, no other UI beyond that. And Sephiroth is with you. Reclaim. So this has to be outside of, of Nibelheim? I think this is outside of Nibelheim. Yeah, this, this is part of the flashback. And rule over the planet with Genova at his side. He wants to reclaim his birthright and rule over the planet with Genova at his side. This could refer to either timeline. Birthright. I don't recognize this bridge at all. There was no bridge outside of... Nibelheim in the original game. However, in the original game, Nibelheim was just like one screen or a couple of screens beyond that to the reactor, but it's just one screen, but you didn't see what happened before that. Like how the road that le leads up to the actual entrance of Nibelheim, you never actually saw it. It looks so open world. It looks super open world. Like there, there's so much environmental detail even in the, the path that you're on. Because in 7 Remake Part 1, the actual path you're walking on there isn't like a lot of detail. It's more or less kind of flat. This looks like there's as much detail in the main road as like the off road. So I wonder, can Cloud like jump off the the bridge right here and explore underneath it? It seems like it hints that Aerith knows she is supposed to die. It also might hint that Sephiroth knew he was defeated. Okay, right now, let me, let me just say this right now. I'm not going to speculate too much on what the parallel or the alternate timelines means just yet. Like the actual details of like, well, who knows what? Does this mean that Sephiroth knows this and he doesn't quite know this? That is so open for debate right now. Um, and the, the stuff that happened at the end of Intergrade with the party and then you, sh you see Zack, right? At the end of Intergrade, the, the party was walking towards Calm. Cloud has his buster sword, but... Zack has the same Buster Sword, but that's not possible unless it were an alternate timeline because there was only supposed to be one Buster Sword. It's like Angeal's family's heirloom or something. So how that, that it's going to resolve itself, I don't know, and I don't yet think it's entirely useful to speculate just yet. All I can really speculate is that there is at least, at least two timelines, could be more, and there's going to be some conflict between the two of them. One is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way you remembered Final Fantasy VII. And this is the alternate way that we're going to change it. We're going to make it the same, but different. 
once again, the plot ghosts rear their ugly head. <laughs> yeah, this is amazing. This looks super amazing. This is an engine, too. This is an engine. We're seeing UI. I think this more or less confirms the two timelines potentially clashing because if you played the original, you know what Sephiroth's endgame already was. But now it's if it's putting that question to you here, it's saying, oh, but do you really? Do you really? I can't say if this is open world yet because, see, I need to see... Here's what I need to see. I need to see Cloud or someone like climbing on top of one of these rocks right here. Like climbing, cutting through this path and climbing up the rocks, going through the bushes or something. Right now they're still on the on a fixed path, but this could be somewhat linear, except it just looks open world. That's very possible too. The white feather and the black feather, one timeline versus another. Um, the white feather was, at least in Crisis Core, was Angeal being like the pure specimen and Genesis being the, the, the failure specimen. I don't know if one, one timeline has a, an acknowledgement or an awareness that the other one exists or what it means or how they can affect each other. If one thing hap if one timeline's events happen, are the other ones inevitable? I don't know. Is there some time skipping? Can Tifa jump from one timeline to the other timeline? I don't know. It's just Cloud and Sephiroth though. I saw you dying there. I figured it was too late. That's Cloud talking about Tifa. Wait, what are you implying? That I died? That I'm some kind of... What? What? Oh my... Oh shit. Does this mean that... There, like Cloud is talking about some alternate version of Tifa. Like she's saying, like, what are you implying? That I, I'm dead? That I'm some kind of imposter? So could this mean that there's some... I think that's it. I think Tifa is more or less kind of like very subtly hinting that there's like an alternate version of her and there's an alternate version of Cloud and he like he remembers things differently than she remembered it. That was like the original thing in, in Final Fantasy VII. But then you kind of chalked it up to, oh, it's because Cloud's memories are fraudulent memories and that the real memory is that he's a fraud. Sorry, spoilers. And, you know, she remembers things the correct way with Zack being the one that visited Nibelheim instead of him. And so what they're doing here is they're, I guess, sort of playing off of that theme that Cloud's memories are not reliable, but they're doing it in the context of multiple timelines. This is going to be like Chrono Trigger. I don't know if it's like Chrono Trigger, because Chrono Trigger, um, its gimmick was that you can change the future depending on, the, maybe, you know, maybe depending on what action you take, and then multiple timelines are available to you. That'd be super cool, actually. That up until a certain period of time, certain events are fixed, but then beyond maybe like the halfway point, there's a couple of paths that you can take that will alter, radically alter, like the different endings of the game. Oh, oh, oh my God, Cloud just... He just hopped like the rock. I don't think that confirms it yet, but maybe that means it's open world because he can now hop this rock. Does Sephiroth hop the rock too? No, he's too cool for that. This is outside Nibelheim. Um, I think I see the water tower in the distance. Oh shit, I think, I think it's open world. I think what, that's what they're confirming here, it's open world. This is the, just like with Final Fantasy 16, this is the, we are an open world game shot. <laughs> Our Aerith or a different Aerith? She's wearing some... Something different. Oh no, sorry. I thought it was a robe she was wearing. An Asian robe. Oh, I'm so intrigued. The, it, potentially, it can still go both ways. It could be Cloud and his unreliable memories, but it could also be an alternate timeline. You were here with me five years ago. That's clever. I have to admit, that's very clever what um, they're doing here. They're playing off of Cloud's unreliable memories, but putting it within the context of the alternate timelines. So that could mean that the alternate timeline thing, it truly could be a red herring. It's almost like they want you to potentially interpret this as a, a potential timeline divergent thing, but they also leave open the interpretation that maybe there is no alternate timeline thing in that it's really just unreliable memories. I don't know, is this going to be a case where the second part invalidates the first part. <laughs>
Oh man, the art presentation, the lighting and everything, that's damn, dude. So this is called Reunion, a uh, Rebirth, I'm sorry. But the Crisis Core game is called Reunion. This is not the White Feather from Final Fantasy VIII. No, it's, uh, it's, it's got to be Angeal's White Feather. That's the only White Feather, at least, that I'm familiar of. Are they fusing? Yeah, so they're fusing, they're fusing stuff from Crisis Core into 7 Remake Part 2. Parallel timelines or Cloud's Unreliable Memories? Or both. Maybe it's an alternate timeline, but they're using Cloud's Unreliable Memories as a way of... Um, as a way of distracting you from the alternate timeline. Like, there could be two timelines, and then uh, maybe Cloud figures it out that there's a, an alternate timeline, and then they're, they're saying, oh, no, no, you know, you're, just, you're just wigging out, you, your memories are false, or f you're a fraud or something, and therefore we can completely discount the alternate timeline. And it turns out there really is an alternate timeline, maybe. Yeah, we did a, did a number on all their hair. But the hair has to look perfect. That's what's taking this game so long. They have to perfect Zack... Cloud, Sephiroth, and Geel, and most importantly, Genesis's hair. Final Fantasy Tactics was, I think, probably the one Final Fantasy game that, and 12, where the primary appeal was not in its characters. But 7's appeal was absolutely, uh, absolutely in its, in its characters, far more than the story. The story itself is quite, you know, pedestrian, you know, where, where uh, freedom fighters fighting against this fascist evil corporation, and then there's a a greater threat that reemerges, and then we more or less have to save the planet. That's kind of like it. But the characters was actually what made Final Fantasy VII so iconic and so memorable. And the way that they did it, sorry, this is a little bit of story craft, but the story craft tool that they used to drive the Final Fantasy VII story, but like in line with its characters, made it remarkably better than... I would say like eight and nine and ten and many of the games that came after it. Um, so its its story itself is less interesting, but the characters were super interesting. Final Fantasy VII Original was ripe with a lot of these what you call like Heart of Darkness moments. So Heart of Darkness, as I've uh, I think I've explained before in one um, a couple of previous videos, is that in Heart of Darkness stories, what we're what's driving the story is that the story beats the plot points are focused around. What is giving the character the most pain or their greatest fear? And I expected that 7 Remake, which it did in part one, will enhance that. It'll like take it to the extreme because now these characters being rendered so realistically with their realistic hair and their realistic clothes are now becoming very real people. What Heart of Darkness plot points to, why they're so effective, is that it's the most efficient way to connect you deeply to the character and it keeps you attached and invested into the character and also allows you to stir them into doing things that they ordinarily wouldn't do. Each one of the characters has a uh, quite a specific heart of darkness. Everything of Cloud, all of the events, all of the characters, uh, all of the, the most iconic moments with him, they were all based off of one thing, the one thing that gave him the most pain and the most fear. And that was echoed across all the games which was being discovered as a fraud. Now, he's not conscious of being a fraud, and the illusion, why his, his character design is so good, is that the illusion that he's created inside of his own mind is so perfect that he believes the fraud himself, like the soldier first class and his entire fight with Sephiroth. Yes, Sephiroth was an existential threat to the planet, but why it really mattered why he mattered to Cloud was that Sephiroth was like the bare naked truth to, that supplemented Cloud's perfectly crafted illusion. And all the stuff with Zack, right? And with Tifa as well. Like, what was it all really about? It was all about Cloud being so afraid to ever be exposed as a fraud. And what's, so, what's particularly so, so effective about the way that Seven Original was designed, its story and characters, well, characters specifically, but the way it drove the story, was that the character's Heart of Darkness is actually bounced off and opposed and came into conflict with each other. Tifa's Heart of Darkness was built off of what? It was all built on top of she didn't want to lose Cloud ever again. Everything that she did from the very moment that the game began was all about keeping him close by. Don't let him stray away anymore. Because after losing her town and after losing her, uh, her family, 
and then you know, losing him for the first time she felt it was her own fault. She didn't want to ever lose him again. So if he's ever exposed as a fraud, right, it would break him completely and therefore she would lose him again. So stuff like that is what I think like Final Fantasy VII has a lot of potential to do, the remake and rebirth, is to really push it in that direction to the extreme. You know, Barrett was about losing his family to Shinra. Uh, Red 13 even had a moment where uh, he was so, so deathly afraid of being like the uh, a cowardly traitor to his people like his father was. And then it, it resolved itself with inside Cosmo Canyon with the, that scene with Seto. It was unfortunate that a lot, of, uh, a lot of the original seven, there were so many ripe moments for it, but we didn't actually get too deep into it. Like, it, it, there was stuff that was hinted, right? Like, Vincent's Heart of Darkness was related to Hojo and Lucretia and Sephiroth. Yuffie was about Wutai and her father. Sid was all about, uh, you know, his dream being devastated about going into space and with Shara. Kate Sith, actually, too, but it was really Reeve's Heart of Darkness about protecting the welfare of the people of Midgar. Like, it was his sacred duty as a public servant. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for in this rebirth, in rebirth and possibly even reunion part two is that yeah this stuff right here this open world gameplay this is sort of what i expected i expected all this to be there here's the gameplay and then cloud's gonna be able to jump over these mountains or these rock formations and he's gonna be like foraging for berries and stuff inside the the forest i really really hope i really really hope i'm gonna be super pissed off if this is all just presentation elements if this is all just like background detail, and then there's like an there's like an invisible wall right here, right? Because in Seven Remake Part One, they had like big open environments too, but you couldn't actually like climb over the trash heaps and stuff. It was so cool. The environments were so cool, but you couldn't interact with it. Like how the combat's gonna work in an open world? Maybe it won't work all that differently as much as we think. I just hope they improve the the AI mainly. Don't just block and dodge. The aerial combat, I guess, is the other thing that I hope they improve on. How is Yuffie going to work? How is, this, how is the, the level regression going to work? We got to level 50 maximum, but we're not going to start level 50 here, are we? Is Yuffie going to like level and materia jack you <laughs> down to level 1? How is the, the party going to work if Yuffie comes into your party, but now, in the open world, you've got, let's say, five or six party members... Because conveniently in the old game, uh, it's explained as, well, you only travel in parties of three because we don't want to travel in big groups that, all, uh, that will draw too much attention to us. And then the other, the other party members that weren't with you just mysteriously vanished. And in 7 Remake Part 1, the characters went out of your party, but they, they used convenient, convenient story excuses as to why Aerith had to leave or why Tifa had to leave. And then, like in the Shinra Tower certain party members left, but then they, were, they formed their own separate party, like with Barrett and Red. Uh, how is that going to work in the open world, though? Are they going to just explain it the way they explained it in the original game? This could be Mount Nibelheim in the back, and then the reactor somewhere over here. You, if you can steal all of our material, we can start from scratch again. Yeah, I'm fine with that, too. I I'm just wondering how that works, though. I mean, if she does that at part two, the beginning of part two, well, in part two you're presumably going to be able to level to level 50 again, right? At the beginning of part three, what happens? Why do you lose all your levels again? So I don't know. That's Seven has already done these things where there's a story. The, the, the story and the, the, the actual stuff that happens in game aren't like congruent. Like how Cloud in cutscene can jump super high, but in the game he can't jump at all. <laughs> I think what they're going to do with the alternate timeline thing is that there is... There is going to be an alternate timeline. Minimum two, they're going to come in a conflict somehow. Perhaps there's going to be a decision that has to be made between going this direction or going this direction. And both of them have potentially negative outcomes. Perhaps going in the same direction that we're going in, Aerith dies, okay, but we save the planet. This direction, Aerith lives, and Zack lives, and Tifa's father lives, and Dine lives. Oh, maybe that's it. Maybe going in one direction is like... All the bad stuff that happened, right? So Dine dies, um, uh, Iflana dies, uh, Aerith dies, Tifa's father dies. A lot of people die. But we save the planet. This other direction, 
everyone lives, but holy fuck, the planet's even more fucked. So it, it, they're both very bad choices, but someone, probably Cloud, is going to have to make or like push the switch. Like, which direction do we go? However, it seems like they're hiding or, or framing it, reframing it into the context of Cloud's unreliable memory. Like when he starts to wig out, all of his memories are unreliable. Oh, is it because you're a fraud? Or is it because you're remembering a different timeline that we're going to conveniently throw in here to make it the same but different? <laughs> I'm most curious about the world design because you can travel across the entire planet in the original. I wonder if we'll be able to... Yes, because um, the world travel restriction means that you can go out of order, but if they, they still want to tell a linear story, doesn't that mean that they're going to have to do it in a way that even if you do things out of order, like in Zelda games, and it still has to all go kind of in a linear direction, unless, unless it's open world, but the stuff that happens in the open world isn't as like there's for example there's midgar and then there's calm and then there's like the the mid the the Miltro cave or something right well it's three main locations and you still have to go into them in this specific order they could put in like artificial barriers like the midgar zalem and stuff to force you to do things in a certain order even though it has the illusion of an open world the semblance of an open world and then there's a bunch of open world stuff right there's like in Final Fantasy games don't have very interesting open world designs. It's just kind of like a flat field with a couple of mountains and uh, 10 added some elevation and then 13 sort of added a little bit more elevation. But they weren't very interesting to explore, which is why I was so, so happy about 16 having an open world because it looks explorable and interesting. Between 16, here's the thing, between 16 and this game, the open world so far, I think they're about the same. It has, this one has a lot of characters. See, like the, this is very Horizon-like, by the way. These mountains, like stretching into like crags and stuff, like fangs. It's, it's realistic looking, but it has character. Like these trees are dead and there's these, these Mako-powered signposts, uh, light posts along the way. Um, there's probably like rain, environmental stuff that happens. Damn, man. Will they be so bold as to give us control of six characters at a time? Gameplay-wise, I'm not worried about this game right now. I am The open world thing was the only thing I was kind of worried about, but it looks nice. It looks great. It looks brilliant. Um, the open world possibilities are absolutely there, but we can't confirm it 100% just yet. I really want to get some confirmation as soon as possible. I want to see Cloud jump over a freaking rock. No, no I'm sorry, sorry. I want to see Cloud jump over a bridge like right there and then fall into the water, dive down to the bottom of the lake, and pick up a Mega Elixir. That's what I want to see. Until I see that, I will not be 100% convinced just yet that this is truly, truly open world. So in terms of graphics, not worried. In terms of the gameplay, not worried. In terms of the, I guess, the general idea of the timelines, I'm less, less worried. I, would, I didn't buy it as much in part one with the plot ghosts. But I guess now that the plot ghosts are sort of out of the way, maybe the plot ghosts don't show up in part two. They're sort of out of the way now. Like they're just used as a convenient excuse to explain there's alternate timelines. Okay, but now that we've explained it, plot ghosts are now gone. Hopefully, cross our fingers. The main thing I'm concerned about now, or just maybe like what I hope for now, is that yeah, they, uh, they play on Final Fantasy VII Originals strength with the characters, which was the Heart of Darkness stuff. And then they really just push it to the extreme. I'm not saying... I think some people misinterpreted the, the video I posted before about, like, make the, the emotion, the pain, like, really hurt. Make it really, really hurt. They, I think they assumed that it meant, like, uh, give us every single scene where people are being, like, beaten the crap out of. No, that's not what it means. It means that um, those, those Heart of Darkness moments that were in the original game, that was originally there... And so I just want them to, to do what they did in the original that made it so memorable, which they, they want to do anyways, but just push it far into the extreme. So, for, for example, let's say that in 7 Remake Part 2, you return to Nibelheim as the party. Uh, you know, that's Cloud and Tifa and Barrett. I think, um, no, Sid's not in your party just yet. Wait, was, it, was, was Rocket Town after Nibelheim or before? I think it was after. Uh, Yuffie's in your party. Red's in your party. You, you come into the town, and it's 
you know, it's all been rebuilt, right? The townspeople are these complete frauds that Shinra had planted, and uh, Cloud's confused. He wants to to get to the bottom of it, but Tifa's freaking out. She wants to leave. You explore the Shinra mansion. A bunch of enemies attack. You know, monsters take out the library, and then that weird enemy, that um, final score or something, it comes out of the safe. It attacks you. You know, the kind of pedestrian stuff. That's okay. That's that. I think if we got that, everyone would be fine with it. But I'm just saying, like moments like that are so so ripe for making the characters like pushing the, the the emotional impact that Final Fantasy VII original had with its characters to the extreme. For example, just change it around, make it the same, but give us something like different. So what if the monsters inside the mansion were the original townspeople, but they've been mutated by Shinra's experiments after they had their town burned down? Like that's, that's super screwed up. And, and then Cloud and Tifa, in a sense, are forced to fight their own hometown and their own neighbors. And just as screwed up for Barrett, right? Because it's the same the same thing as Coral. You trust Shinra, and then they backstab you in the worst way possible. I don't know, like, Cloud can't fight them. Tifa can't fight them. This is so screwed up. Well, what's even more screwed up, if Cloud is forced to fight, like, a Sephiroth clone, or even, like, his own undead mother, who's been mutated, and, it, right, it's, it's forcing him to reveal his fraud. And what's even worse for Tifa, what if one of the mute, the, 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 the dead towns members, townspeople who've been mutated, one of them is like her father and she's forced to fight her father, that sort of thing. I think if, si- if Seven Remake is able to do this, like push those, those emotional moments that were so iconic and memorable in the original to the extreme, then uh, I think Seven Remake Part 2, Rebirth, and 16 would be like kind of even for me. But right now, just because uh, of my hero, 16 has an edge. Maybe with the exception of the Chocobo, I wouldn't want to use any kind of transportation. I want to walk. I want them to create a world where I can walk through all of it and just like enjoy it, just soak up all the environment. Same question I have with 16. How many side quests are there going to be? Is this just environment for the sake of environment? It's explorable open world. Okay, that's cool. But is there anything to do between the destinations? Will there be people you can help? Will there be little quests you can do, little dungeons you can explore to get new rewards and stuff? That's what's so so promising about this is that, yeah, we knew that it was going to be open world, but how open world? You assume they will add side quests from here to Casa del Sol? I imagine so. They had it in part one. Um, but uh, let's just be honest. The part one side quests were not really all that interesting. They weren't very consequential either find some cats and you know find some cds and some music kill a behemoth that's kind of about it they didn't they also didn't have any bearing on the um, the main scenario quest either i wouldn't mind actually too much if seven remake part two rebirth is actually a very short game in terms of its its msq exploration because think about it from from midgar all the way until let's say that part two ends around Rocket Town. What's really there? There's Calm, there's the Chocobo Ranch, the Milthro Cave, the, um, the, what is it, the, the Fort Condor area, Junon, Casa del Sol, uh, Coral, actually it's a lot of places. Was it the Golden Saucer, Gongaga, uh, going up, snaking up, uh, Cosmo Canyon, and then Nibelheim. Yeah, if that's the main scenario quest, you can imagine doing all that. So that's like a solid 40, 45 hour game. But with this open world, suddenly you've got the potential for a 400 hour game. It's just all the side quest stuff. These open world games, what's so so cool, I think, personally about them, is that the main scenario quest isn't what makes the game interesting. It's all the stuff in between. It's the journey from point A to point B that is so interesting. Midgar, leaving Midgar, okay, we head to Calm, but there's a whole flashback for that. That's gotta be a solid, a solid two hour thing, easily. Then, okay, the, the Chocobo Ranch, that's kind of a middle a little thing. I bet you, I I bet you, the Midgar Zalem, they're gonna, they're gonna make it its own boss. Because just like with the, the Hell House, it was a, a random thing that they added in there just to deter you from going across the marsh without a Chocobo. 
but then in the <laughs> here, I think they realize that there's certain things in in Seven Original that just a lot of ideas they threw out, and then some of it just stuck with people over the years. And now there's they're they're gonna play on the nostalgia super hard, like. Oh, you remember that Midgar Zalem that was just giving you some trouble? Oh, shoot. We turn it into like a five-phase boss. Now it's got like beta squared that like nukes the entire field or something. So they're going to make that a big thing. The Milthro Cave, okay, with Elena and the, 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 the Turks. Okay, that's not a, a super large thing. Fort Condor, we sort of already got with the Fort Condor minigame. Junon, they're going to make a big deal out of that with Rufus and like the whole parade. Casa del Sol, I, I, I think they're going to do some bikini shit with um, Tifa and Aerith. Coral, then there was the Golden Saucer, which is a whole other big thing. And then the whole Dine sequence, that's a big thing. That's a lot. That's seriously a lot. And I, I hope, God, I hope that with this open world thing, ditch the whole chapter thing. I do not want chapters in this game. Um, unless it's done in a way that does not prohibit the open world exploration. It's a lot, but it's a great natural end with a lot of how crazy. Look, I'm fine. I'm fine with them giving us like a 300-hour MSQ shit. I'm just saying, considering the, the scope of what they're trying to do. And then with Gungaga, some stuff is going to be hinted with Zack, but it's going to be like a little... Set. Then Cosmo Canyon was also like its own big thing. You know, there's a lot of good set pieces. And then with Nibelheim, Nibelheim's going to be a big thing too. That's a lot of big things. And then Rocket Town, that's, a lo that's another big thing. I'm just afraid that if they use up too many of their big things right now, that part three isn't going to be as a big thing, you know, because save some stuff for part three, ending at the Forgotten City or just after. I think what a lot of people are kind of basing what their predictions on where it ends in part two off of is I think we're, th we're focusing more on like emotional moments. The, the Forgotten City, okay, that makes sense because that's where Aerith meets her end. But in terms of gameplay, does that really make sense though? Because the Forgotten City is quite far. You're, you've gotten really, really quite far geographically. Like, you more or less span the entire globe at that point. Based off of what we saw in Ever Crisis with Crisis Core, the way that they announced this whole thing, I think what they're, they're sticking to in Part 2 and 3 is going to be Final Fantasy VII Original and Crisis Core, and that's it. I don't think anything from Dirge of Cerberus... Or maybe, maybe just small things, like Yuffie's uh, Moogle outfit. Like, just small little nods, but not anything super substantial. I think Nomura had already confirmed before 7 Remake Part 1 was out that before Crisis, Crisis Core, and Dirge of Cerberus, they, they aren't technically canon. However, we will take certain things from them and we'll make them canon. And I think what they're taking is specifically 7 Original, and Crisis Core. That's the main thing. And that was even hinted at by Professor Hojo with uh, like the, the Project G and the G-type soldiers or something. I think they're taking more from Crisis Core than anything else. Expect some heavy stuff with Zack. Maybe even Angeal and Genesis in Remake Part 2. I would even wager that Nibelheim could be the ending for Rebirth. That is a ton of shit. Because that would be before... Rocket Town, Temple of the Ancients, Wu Tai. Well, Wu Tai was optional, but there's no way to get to it before um, before getting the Tiny Bronco. The Northern Crater, and then potentially they can add more more areas that we haven't seen yet. Like Modeoheim was in the the snowy mountains and stuff. Uh, and then there's like the the weapons, and there's there's a good amount of stuff that they can still we can still do in part three that won't like be totally exhausted if it ends at Nibelheim. Gongaga, where the, the broken reactor was, in the original game, all that happened was you stopped by and then the Turks sort of stopped you. There was a blown up reactor. There's going to there's gonna be some backstory that they go over as well. In 7 Original, just like with many other Final Fantasy games, there's a lot of areas, like little forest patch areas and along the beach and stuff that it was just kind of there for the sake of being there, like cartography stuff, but you didn't really ever explore it. The whole sand area around the golden saucer and stuff, like, oh man, there's just so... The, the coral prison, the desert, there's so many, so many things they can do. So much character that can be brought into this Final Fantasy... I'm like, I'm so glad they're doing this. So glad. They might also finish everything at Nibelheim and then 
Vincent is like the DLC, sort of like how Yuffie was the DLC for Remake Part 1, right? Because you meet Yuffie more or less after leaving Midgard. You, have to, you, you can uh, come across her just randomly on the field. And then they made her a DLC, which kind of like completes the, the story and like what was, like what was happening. What was, Yuffie was basically what was happening during Remake Part 1, but just from a different point of view. What they could do in Rebirth is starting from Midgar to Calm and then going all the way to Nibelheim, ending it there. And then while we're waiting for Part 3, there could be a Vincent DLC that comes out that does the same thing. It gives us some context as to what Vincent was doing all this time and how he got into the casket. And that's when you find him. And then you cross paths and then uh, Vincent and the party meet each other at the beginning of part three, sort of how Yuffie and the party will presumably meet each other at the beginning of part two. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe.